everyone. Thank you for coming today to listen to my presentation on uh, investigating the effects of automated vehicle driving operations on emissions and uh, traffic performance. As Laura mentioned, I do this under the supervision of Professor Marianne Hutzelpi and Professor Matt Murda. So to begin, the motivation exactly. Why did I bother researching automated vehicles? Well, our urban our, our urban fabric is changing, transportation is going to evolve over the next coming years. Uh, the advancement of technology um, is, is, is improving. We're moving into the direction of where our vehicles are going to start to be able to either communicate with each other through connected vehicles, um, be automated, so sense their environment on their own and traverse through our transportation networks, or even the combination, connected and automated vehicles, where they can gather information and operate um, on their own with limited uh, um, human input. Uh, and then also another thing that's important, as well as that new business models are going to be uh, uh, coming into effect, such as Uber, automated uh, Ubers and uh, rideshare and all this stuff, uh, all these types of um, services that have the potential of exploiting this automated technology. Um, so here in the next couple of slides I'll be looking into, um, I'll be discussing a bit of the research I've done, the background research literature. Uh, so. A lot of the studies that have been already put out there, although it's been very limited since it's a new field, an emerging field and emerging technology, uh, many researchers have identified the effects on driving. So IEVs have the potential of changing the acceleration and deceleration, uh, like our, the driving is how vehicles accelerate and decelerate as they traverse the network. They, they have um, potential in changing the car following norms, so that's the longitudinal behavior. So how vehicles follow each other as they're, as they're, they're driving along. And also, Gap acceptance thresholds and lateral movements. So this this is the changing uh, the changing lane uh, as vehicles are driving. Um, they also looked at some expected benefits. So initially, they believe uh, researchers believe that with this new technology, we have the potential of increasing our capacity on our networks, improving the efficiency of, of of the traffic flow, improved safety because you're really taking out that human air component more or less. Although in the news lately, it says otherwise, but. Um, so that there's improved safety and also uh, potential in reduction in emissions. However, there's also the potential that initially automated vehicles might be more uh, cautiously programmed, conservatively programmed, which might initially show some degradation of our transportation networks. Um, the positive effects may also not be a hundred really noticeable until you exceed 50% uh, penetration, market penetration on the network. And finally, um, ABs may also induce more demand and increase VKT. So they might improve capacity and, all, and, and, and improve efficiency and all this of our networks, however, it might induce more demand. And if it induces more demand, will that also, uh, will we be able to see the benefits or will it all go back into a vicious cycle and have more of an effect? Uh, so the research is still, the verdict is still out for that. No one really can say 100%. Uh, some existing studies on the work that I've done. So there's some sensitivity analysis, analysis that were conducted in the literature where they vary the parameters to see the effects of the parameters, uh, uh, the driving behavior parameters in the model. Um, so they varied them individually, but they kept them within ranges that are believed to be um, specific to a human conventional operated vehicle, uh, conventional vehicle. Um, some simulation of these, so there was uh, studies which actually varied the parameters within VISM uh, to attempt to simulate automated vehicles. There's other um, uh, studies that, uh, focus mostly on automated technology such as adaptive cruise control, cooperative adaptive cruise control. So automated like automated light technologies, but not exactly the whole the fully automated um, vehicle. So uh, so a lot of the studies focused on that. However, what I noticed was and this is where I come in, hopefully, initially, um, there's a limited literature on environmental impacts uh, as a result of A V potential A V driving. So this is where I come in and I, I evaluate the traffic performance but then I see what does that mean? For, um, emissions. So that leads me to my research objectives. So what I do essentially is identify the boundaries of potential AV operation. I go from aggressive to cautious AV operation. And we have the conventional vehicle which is somewhere in, in the middle, the default. Um, so I want to I, I understand those and identify those. Then I take these parameters and I evaluate them to um, under different operating regimes. So high traffic, low traffic, and different uh, flow characteristics. So under uninterrupted flow, or interrupted flow, and I'll explain what that means uh, shortly. And then finally, I assess the driving behavior of automated vehicles when it comes to emissions and uh, traffic performance. So now we move into the methodology. 
So my methodology basically consists of a traffic simulation, which is MVism. I do these two analysis methods. I do a sensitivity analysis of the parameters and then a parameter scenario analysis. And finally, I plug that into an emission uh, model to actually calculate the environmental impact. So uh, my traffic micro simulation consists of the VISM 9.0 platform. Uh, so what I've done here is I have two uh, networks that I study. So I have the Gardener Expressway. So this is going to serve as my uninterrupted flow. Uh, the uninterrupted flow meaning there's no traffic signals, there's no training movements. Any interactions that are done on the network are as a result of the vehicles traversing the network, changing lanes, merging, diverging, and all that. So I think this section of the Gardener, uh, for the reason that it has uh, various uh, different types of geometry in terms of on and off ramps, merging, diverging, lane drops, this is different from the literature because the literature usually focused on um, a specific section. Like they would simulate AVs and how they would operate on uh, uh, through merging and diverging lanes or specifically just on and off ramps. And then I look here, I have, a, I have a interrupted flow. So this is an urban arterial based off of College Street just in front of the campus here. Um, interrupted flow because it has signalized intersections and turning movements which impede, or uh, I wouldn't say impede, but uh, like interfere with traffic flow characteristics. So I did this to see um, the difference between the two types, uh, how the AVs operate underneath the two different networks. Um, so the traffic demand, so the Gardner Expressway, uh, in the initial, the base case demand was uh, based after morning peak period uh, traffic flows, hourly traffic flows. Um, for College Street, we had done uh, traffic counts at the intersection of College of St. George, so we used that to load our network. Um, the, the observed values, or the values that I got from the Gardner Expressway was the high traffic scenario, so my base case for the gardener was the high traffic scenario, and then I reduced that by 50% to do a low traffic scenario for the gardener. When you came to the college street, the observed values acted as my low traffic scenario, and then I increased the demand there by 50% to put my high traffic. And I have, I have this here, this is my uh, traffic loading profile, an example for the gardener. The reason why I show this here is because in order to ensure that I accommodate all, of the, all the demand and I, I have realistic flow characteristics, um, uh, flow characteristics on the network, I, I gradually loaded the network to uh, gradually increase to congestion and then end, end the simulation with a gradual dissipation of congestion. So this was to have more realistic uh, flow and also to ensure that all of the, all of the demand that was observed actually went into the network. We had some issues with that issue. Um, so this here, this slide describes the longitudinal lateral movement. So this is the car following sub models and the lane changing models that are in VISM that I, uh, that I modify. So we have two models in VISM, movement 74, which is usually used for urban road, and then movement 99, uh, which is usually used for freeway. However, the literature had shown, and research had indicated that movement 99 uh, is, is also, you could also use on an urban arterial, which is what I did. And the main reason why I use it is because it has more parameters. So there's more flexibility to, to vary uh, the parameters to try to capture the automated vehicle operations. And then we have the lane changing model, which covers the lateral movements. So that's the um, lateral movements, lane changing. Um, so here we have the driving behavior parameters. So these are the ones that I identified from literature. I have, uh, I haven't counted them recently, but I believe there's eight from the car following and two from the um, uh, the lane changing model. So I have the default values here and the range that goes from aggressive AV, so this is the most aggressive that, that we expect uh, an automated vehicle could potentially operate in, which is a little bit more aggressive than someone, a human driving being uh, operating aggressively. And then we have cautious uh, automated vehicle settings here. So basically my sensitivity analysis, I vary them within the range one at a time, from aggressive to default, to the default all the way to the cautious, and then when it comes to the parameter scenario analysis, I actually simulate at the extremes. Um, so to move into our emissions. So the emission estimation framework consists of emission factors that was extracted from MOVES. Uh, the, uh, this is the US EPA Motor uh, Vehicle Emission Simulator. The vehicle fleet and age composition for Ontario and then the vehicle trajectories which came out of VISM. I calculated the vehicle specific power, which is basically the power that is required uh, to, to basically move the vehicle through the, through the network. And then from this VSP, which is a function of acceleration um, and, and mass of the vehicle and a few other, uh, I have a few other um, parameters as well. Uh, uh, from there you can assign the operating mode or the power mode to each vehicle, which from there, uh, the emission factor from moves gets assigned to the, the, the vehicle. And then finally, and I, I, I also track the vehicle kilometer traveled, so I can normalize these total emissions by DKT in order to create a fair comparison between the scenarios and between uh, Gardiner and College Street. 
Uh, the vehicle fleet composition is based off of the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario. Uh, they have uh, a database with the, the, the vehicle, uh, vehicle fleets in the region. I focused mostly on passenger cars because I want to do that um, comparison between conventional and, and automated vehicles for passenger, passenger vehicle travel. Um, so I simulated both AVs and conventional vehicles as 2016 vehicles. And the reason why I did this, I, I made them both the same model year, was so that I can strictly evaluate their performance uh, their emission performance based on the difference in their operations and their behavior. Because if I included um, the age difference, because AVs are going to be more technologically advanced, if I included that, I would capture a lot of the effects of technology on, 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 the, on the emissions, which I wanted to avoid. I wanted to focus most on the operations. Um, so here we have a fuel cycle emissions. So we have the operating emissions, which are the dark blue, and the upstream GHG emissions, which are the light blue. So the dark blue, the operating emissions, are the ones that came out of Moose. Um, so these are the emission factors from Moose. So this is the operating emissions. So these are the emissions that come out of the tailpipe as the vehicle drives. Then we have the upstream GHG emissions, which basically is a result, is the GHG or the CO2 equivalent emissions that come out from producing the required fuel, uh, from extracting crude oil and all that to, to produce the fuel to basically uh, power our vehicles. Um, so that came from a, a fuel cycle emission model known as GREET. And um, from there, it gave us the gram of CO2 equivalent produced per energy, uh, unit energy. And then uh, the energy consumption is associated with each operating mode, and from there, we were able to convert it into an emission rate in grams per second. So when I calculate the emissions, um, the vehicle is assigned to each operating mode, and this emission factor is uh, assigned to that vehicle, and the emissions are calculated. Now you can see here we have three regimes of operating modes. We have the low power modes, somewhere in the middle, and the higher speed, higher power operating modes. Um, you can see here higher speeds, higher power modes re result in more emissions, while lower uh, result in uh, uh, lower power, lower speeds, lower power modes result in, in less emission output. Um, so, next slide. We also, I also investigated electric vehicles just to do the comparison. Um, so from here, it's a bit different how we how we generate the emissions. We have the uh, average uh, cons energy consumption. It's not associated with operating mode. We have the average energy consumption for cars and passenger trucks or SUVs, where I, I combine those um, uh, to um, we combine those with the uh, amount of emissions that are that are generated in order to produce the energy to power electric vehicles, and from there we get a standard emission factor of 13.81 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilometer. And as you can see, we have a, here's the proportion of where the Ontario, uh, this is how energy is generated in, 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 our, in Ontario. So using the energy mix of Ontario. Um, so uh, this, now I'm going to move into the analysis framework. So like I mentioned earlier, we have the one at a time sensitivity analysis and our parameter scenario analysis. Um, I'll explain them in more detail here. So the sensitivity analysis is where I examine each parameter individually in order to capture their individual effects. That's to isolate each parameter to see which one has plays the largest role in, in terms of affecting uh, GHG emissions, average speed, and delay. So GHG emissions are emission indicator, average speed, and delay is our traffic performance. Scenario-based analysis, I have to do aggressive AVs versus conventional versus cautious AVs, electric versus powered uh, versus uh, gasoline powered. And then I also go and I do um, a market penetration um, just to see how, how as we um, introduce slowly vehicles into the network that might change. And we have the high traffic, low traffic, urban freeway, and urban arterial corridor. So, going into our results. Uh, here is the results of the one at a time analysis. As you can see from all the parameters, more or less the percent difference, the, the, the y-axis is the percent difference in GHG emission factor from the base case, and the, uh, the x-axis is the actual parameter value. So as you can see from these graphs here, all the parameters, mostly all of them, uh, or a good chunk of them have very limited effect, except the ones I highlighted here. Headway time, which is CC1 parameter, and the safety distance reduction factor. So this is a car falling parameter, this is a lane changing parameter. So this here governs, the headway time basically governs the time gap between the vehicles. So as you can see, on, under high traffic, on an on uninterrupted flow like the Gardener, the slower the time gap, the smaller the time gap between the vehicles, and there's a reduction in emissions. And this being uh, can be attributed to the fact of much smoother operations, potential platoon creation, and, 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 and all these uh, benefits. As you, as you move with uh, farther away, so this is more cautious behavior, you end up degrading the network. Vehicles are trying to stay spaced out, stays apart, uh, spaced apart, and 
just everyone is being cautious, and it's just it's not overall a good uh, situation to be in. Uh, the safety distance reduction factor, so this is the percentage different, the percentage of your safety distance that you're willing to reduce when changing uh, a lane. So if you have uh, 0.1 here, safety distance reduction factor, you're basically willing to take up 90% of your safety distance when changing a lane. So you're, really, you're willing to go really close to a vehicle as you're changing lanes, as opposed to, you know how usually you want to maintain some sort of distance uh, when, when, you, when you're changing lanes. So that also had an impact on our GHG emission factor. Uh, here we have um, uh, tra some traffic performance indicators. Again, all the parameters mostly have negligible effects. It's the headway time. Uh, as you go more cautious, you have an increase in delay and a decrease in average in your average speed. And the same thing, with, although at a much smaller scale, your safety distance reduction factor has a similar, similar trend. Um, when I looked at the low traffic scenario, you can see again the trends are very similar, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So the same two parameters are impacted, but I want you to pay attention to the scale here. The effects are at a much lower, lower um, magnitude. I believe before I was in the order of magnitude 20 percent. Now we're down to two percent uh, reduction in emissions at the most, um, at the most aggressive case. Similar with the safe distance reduction factor, and all the other parameters more or less did not in place. So this shows this sensitive also shows us that the governing parameters in the operation of the day, these will be the headway time, and basically the safe the safe the safety distance, uh, or how yeah. So it's all associated with the safety distance, right? So if you want to stay closer to a vehicle, you're reducing your 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 safety distance to that vehicle. Um, and here for the low traffic, again we have the average delay and speed. Once again, much smaller magnitude in terms of impact, but same parameters are, are the governing ones. All right, so this is the interesting one. I was went through a lot to get to this. Um, here we have aggressive, conventional, cautious. The dark blue is our high traffic scenario on the Gardiner Expressway. The light gray here is our low traffic scenario, and the green here is our emission factor for the electric vehicle. And if you look at the lines, the red here, based off of the scale on, this, on the right, is the vehicles kilometer traveled for high and low traffic. Um, so, what you can see here, total fuel cycle emission factor for the high traffic scenario. Aggressive AVs reduce it. I, this was down to a reduction of around 26% reduction in, in our GHG emission factor from the base case, uh, while our cautious AVs go at a much higher increase of 35%. And what are, it's interesting to note here, look at the VKTs. So the aggressive and the conventional vehicle were able to accommodate 100% of the demand that had loaded the network with. All the vehicles went in, VKTs remained the same, and as a result of the operation of the vehicle, uh, the behavior of the AVs, we had a reduction in our emissions. If you look here at our cautious vehicles, it degraded the network, it, 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 it degraded the network so much to the point where a lot of vehicles, like I, 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 a, large, a large chunk of the vehicle demand that I was putting in ended up staying outside of the network over my one hour simulation. Um, and so, but despite the fact that there were less vehicles on the road, our intensity, our GHG emissions have gone up, and that is as a result of the operation. There's a lot of stop and go to try to maintain the distance. It produced a lot of congestion, uh, which we'll, we'll also see um, uh, later on. Now, the reason why I put the electric vehicle here so you can see, we do all this, automated vehicles, uh, the operations, it will reduce GHG emissions, but in reality, what we should be looking at is electrification of vehicles, because from there we can drop our emissions, our emission country, like our transportation emissions, uh, by almost over 90 percent. We go from 200, 284 in the conventional vehicle case grams of CO2 per kilometer uh, down to 13.81. So, in, in a time of age when global warming is a big issue, where transportation is a huge impact on, our, on, on, on emissions, uh, looking into more advanced technology is also something we should consider. Uh, here I have traffic performance indicators. Very similar to you can see from the sensitivity analysis, um, our, our average speed increases with aggressive behavior, more aggressive behavior decreases with uh, uh, more cautious behavior. You have an increase in delay. Um, now, what I wanted to show here in your low traffic, and that was also evident before in the emissions, where you saw the difference in the emissions before in the low traffic scenario was very was um, very limited. Like you couldn't even tell the difference; it was very small. So the same thing here, you can see that there's very small differences between that. And that is inherent of the low traffic loading. So when there's low traffic, when there's low, uh, uh, small, less traffic on the network, 
Um, there's less interaction between the vehicles. The vehicles are more separate, and you don't really uh, see much of the um, uh, benefits of automated vehicle operations, or the disbenefits in the case of cautious vehicles. Um, this here I have, uh, the speed flow curves for the high traffic uh, scenario of the Gardner Expressway. So in the gray we have cautious vehicle uh, AVs, orange is conventional, and the blue is our aggressive. So what you can see here is the conventional vehicle for the, for the Gardner Expressway was roughly, it had a capacity just around 2,200 vehicles per hour per lane. Our conventional vehicles brought that down to just under 1,500. So that's as a result of the more cautious behavior, breakdown in the network, uh, vehicles trying to maintain their, their spacing, and a lot of the stop and go and congestion buildup associated with that. Now, what I wanted to point out is you can notice in the aggressive vehicle, you don't have the full curve. It was able, the aggressive AVs were able to satisfy the exact same demand as the conventional vehicle uh, scenario, but still remain on the uncongested side of the, of the speed flow curve. So, mind you though, this is not considered latent demand, so AVs will introduce more demand as a result. Uh, it's potential that this obviously this curve will go around and come back and have a, a congested side to it. However, it is anticipated, uh, based on what I see here, is that it will be able to service more vehicles with a much more uh, larger amount of throughput and a higher capacity. So there is an improvement um, in the performance. Uh, here we have the market uh, penetration aggregator for aggressive AVs because the cautious ones see the opposite. You were going worse. Um, so here, as you can see. Uh, we have the high traffic and the low traffic. So the low traffic, no matter how, whether your penetration is zero or 100, very stable changes. Like the, not, you can't really notice the changes very minimal. It's the um, aggressive case, or the high traffic, the high traffic case where you notice a much higher, uh, a much steeper uh, uh, reduction in emissions with your penetration. And the same thing here we have average speed on the right. Now this is contrary to what is found in the literature where they said you won't really notice the effects until over 50%. Although as you can see here, as soon as you start loading the network with automated vehicles, you start seeing somewhat of a gradual um, uh, uh, reduction in emissions. Okay, moving to the College Street network. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this as well because as you can see the trends are more or less the same. The same parameters are the governing ones. You notice the magnitude is much lower. Uh, the impact, uh, the magnitude of the impact is much lower than uh, uh, the gardener, uh, that's as a result of the interrupted flow of the traffic signals that you're moving. The other thing I wanted to point out was that this standstill distance parameter also became something of more significance on the College Street network. And, that, and this parameter here is basically, standstill distance is when you come to a stop, how much distance do you want to maintain from the vehicle in front of you. So this is, this has a, a bigger um, impact on College Street because there's a lot of stop and go. There's a lot of uh, stopping for intersection, stopping for turn, uh, vehicles making the left and right. So this parameter came out a bit more, uh, uh, have a little bit more of an influence. Uh, here we have the, the low traffic scenario as well for the average delay in speed. Again, governing parameters are headway, uh, headway time and safety distance reduction factor. The remaining parameters did not prove much sensitivity, or emissions were not very sensitive to perturbations in those uh, parameters. Um, high traffic, again, we have the headway time safety distance reduction factor, as you go more uh, um, you go more cautious, you have an increase in your emissions. The scale for high traffic, consistent with the Gardner Expressway, high traffic is at a much larger scale, not as much as, 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 as Gardner Expressway, but um, much larger than what we saw under the low traffic scenario. Uh, and here we have percent change, again, those are the parameters that we're covering the two. All right, interesting stuff again. So, as you can see here, like I, the same color scheme as before, so I won't go over that. Uh, we have the high traffic scenario, aggressive ADs, reducing emissions again, but look, the change is only 3%, not, and not like um, the Gardner where we had 26%. So this, uh, again, could be attributed to the interrupted flow. ADs do not have much of an effect. You don't have the potential to exploit the benefits of automated vehicles. Uh, when there's a lot of interruption to its flow because regardless of whether the vehicle is driving aggressively or it's driving cautiously or it's driving like uh, or it's driving the way we operate our vehicles um, you still have to stop the traffic lane right so even if you operate at a much closer headway um, you still have to end up uh, uh, 
to stopping other traffic lights. However, we do have the potential of having much smoother operations, much more efficient flow through the network. Uh, vehicles might not end up stopping much on the um, at the traffic. Not many vehicles might end up stopping at the traffic light as much as they were under conventional. Then we have the low traffic, which again, very consistent BKTs and almost negligible changes in our emission factor. Uh, traffic performance here, uh, similar trends, average speed increases with aggressive, uh, reduces with cautious, not much of a change in low uh, traffic uh, conditions. Um, all right, what we have here, so instead of a speed flow curve, because we can't really do that, uh, I, I'm showing here the number of stops. So look how much the number of stops go up with, with our cautious automated vehicles under high traffic. So again, high traffic scenario shows much larger differences. The aggressive AVs, like I said, as a result of the closer um, operation of the vehicles, much um, uh, creating like those little, uh, basically more stable traffic flow in the network. You have less vehicles stopping uh, at traffic lights, so you can potentially get more vehicles through, through, the, net, through the network uh, spending um, less time on the road. Uh, and uh, what we have here as well is our conventional vehicle. So like I said earlier, there's not much of a difference on, on the interrupted. Uh, so uh, when you look here at our scenario analysis on College Street, uh, and we have our market penetration, uh, again, the changes in our, in our emissions are, are much, uh, much smaller. Um, as, as we penetrate our uh, penetrate the network with automated vehicles, uh, you don't see much of a difference. Uh, so the biggest thing that we can come from here, that we can get from here, is that when you have um, traffic lights or turning movements, the vehicles, uh, uh, basically, no traffic lights and turning movements, the vehicles get interrupted very often. So you don't have much of an opportunity to exploit the benefits of automated vehicles and how they could. Um, and so traverse the network more efficiently because you need to stop all the time. Now, that's like, so uh, that's also why we, we notice the trends here of um, there not being much of a change. Now, actually, I wanted to go back quickly here. Sorry, this is why I paused. I wanted to point out, since I have some time, I wanted to point out here, the, you look at the order of magnitude of, of, the, of the emission factors on the College Street Network. Here we're over at 300, we're over 300 grams of CO2 per kilometer. Uh, when you look back at the, at, the, at the Gardner Expressway, we're at 284 grams per kilometer of CO2 for the conventional vehicle. Now, the reason why you might see that, see uh, see this is because under the College Street Network, we have lower speeds, more vehicles are stopping, right? And when I went back to the operating modes in the initial graph that I showed you with AVs, lower power modes. Although the emission at lower speeds and lower power modes is much smaller than that at a higher speed, you're spending more time stopping on the network, congestion, build up, uh, idling. So if you spend more time on the network, you basically emit more emissions. Uh, uh, you have more emissions. Uh, as opposed to on the Gardner Expressway, when you're at higher speeds, higher operating modes, although you're emitting more as you're, as you're at that higher speed, you're spending less time on the network. You're moving more efficiently. So you need to strike, there's a balance that needs to be strike at this point. So uh, higher speeds, although more emissions, you spend less time on the road, your overall impact, your overall intensity is much lower. So I wanted to say that. Um, so again, here, not much, not very interesting penetration as you penetrate the changes. All right, so some key takeaways that I wanted to bring up here. So I mentioned this throughout uh, my presentation, but aggressively programmed AVs result in the most positive impacts. So if we want to improve our networks in terms of emission, improve our networks in terms of traffic performance, we want to program our ideas more on the cautious, on the aggressive side, sorry, aggressive side of our driving behavior spectrum. The cautious program, the cautiously programmed ADs, although initially in order to get people uh, uh, enticed by the technology and more comfortable with the technology, we might see these cautiously programmed ADs on the road, it's not something we want to maintain for the, for the long term because they will degrade our network, they will they will, they will negatively impact the traffic performance and as a result, uh, have an increase in emissions, which is not a favorable 
in, uh, which is not favorable. Our, the effects were also more noticeable under high traffic conditions and uninterrupted flow. High traffic conditions, uh, you're able to uh, have larger interactions between the, um, more interaction between the vehicles, so you can exploit the benefits. These are where the operating efficiencies could come out of automated vehicles, and uninterrupted flow operations is, uh, is, is, is also exploits those benefits because you don't have that mandatory stop uh, at intersections, or those mandatory um, stop behind vehicles that want to change lanes or uh, make turns. Some future work. So what I've done is initial steps. Uh, like this is a this is a new thing. Like this is a new area of research, right? So a lot of what has been done, a lot of what I've done, are initial initial steps, moving in the direction of how we can estimate um, uh, the impacts of automated vehicles. So I've identified some methodological improvements, so more scenarios that could potentially go into the mix to evaluate them. Uh, also considering connectivity, although that will require um, much more advancement in our traffic simulation tools, which I believe is coming, is, is, is something that is, is happening and is in the process. So I, I believe relatively uh, soon we should have a bunch of traffic simulation tools to be able to capture these new transformative technologies. Um, Improvements on modeling ABs, so that goes under our simulation improvements as well. So developing a car following model uh, externally from our visit from from our traffic micro simulation um, packages to, to try to capture the uh, the behavior of ABs much better. Although those assumptions, are, like those are also going to be assumptions. So without the actual technology available by car manufacturers, we don't know where automated vehicle, how automated vehicles are going to operate in order to estimate them. So everything we do is based on assumptions and how we feel uh, or how we expect automated vehicles to be operating. However, we also have the potential to reverse the process. Maybe we could come up with an optimal setting of automated vehicles in, in a simulation, in a traffic simulation, and from there advise our manufacturers to design vehicles in that sense. Another thing worth exploring is our infrastructure changes. So uh, parking locations are changing. Like, there's a lot of things that are going to change. Parking locations could change. You might have parking moving uh, outside of the, um, the downtown core as a result of vehicles being able to drop off their passengers and going somewhere else to park. So exploring how that could play into the mix and how changes in infrastructure might occur. Smart infrastructure for connectivity, so connecting to traffic lights, connecting to vehicles, connecting to each other, connecting to uh, traffic management centers. Uh, and then also, finally, if we want to pursue electric vehicle uh, technology, how can we exploit the, um, the benefits of that while also um, making it readily available for there to be power stations around our cities in order to satisfy the energy demand for, um, for electric vehicles. would be on the person that's supposed to be supervising the AV. So, yes, to cover themselves from the legal perspective, initially on the AV. I have a question, too. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, going back to your Gardner uh, case study, how did you handle access egress, uh, like flows onto and off of the ramps? Because I mean, it seems to me, particularly the egress, like if the garden, you simulate the morning peak period, um, you get a lot of spillback up the exit ramps at places like Spadina and Jarvis, mm -hmm. uh, which I think have major impact. How are you handling ponds and ponds, and to what extent uh, are you just dealing with the free flow through, the flow through the garden or not really too much about that sort of stuff? Well, actually, one of the main reasons why I have to do that traffic loading, uh, that very traffic loading to uh, uh, bring up the congested and anticipated, was because that spillback pond was put on the Spadina and the Jarvis uh, on ramps, especially, I believe, was it in the westbound. Uh, the westbound direction. Most of the there was a large amount of spillback, and that was that was where a lot of the vehicles were not entering the network. So I had that, uh, I had a little bit of um, flexibility with uh, because the data that I had uh, that I received to, to load the network, uh, they were aggregated in terms of the exits. So I was able to also vary a bit on how much and where comes it from. So the, the, the data for the running specimen came from a study that Professor Buhai and Professor Gorda had done 
uh, back, uh, it was a few years ago for the uh, teardown of government space. So they were aggregated with the, for the, for the, for the uh, on and off range. So I was able to uh, be a little bit flexible on, on how many, um, the percentage distribution, but also varying that, that, the, the flow rates over the simulation period. I was more, sorry, what I was more focusing on is, like, is um, as a result of the advancement of technology and the fact that, automated, that these vehicles might be able to, to, to operate without much supervision of, of human, uh, of, of drivers, of human uh, people inside the, the world here, but of people inside the road. Uh, <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of those like parking facilities that you find in downtown, which are huge parking lots, could end up moving somewhere uh, further outside of the downtown core, and then that might change. It. Like it changes our land use, so that space then can be used for other things. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't see. I don't know necessarily how that would affect our traffic flow, other than we're going to have a lot of vehicles on the road driving without any passengers. So that might have an impact in terms of our demand. As well. It is, but if the AB, but if, if the AB drops you off, then yeah. It seems like you know, you're looking at what happened on King Street, you say, well, I mean, that seems like a future. So, does that mean we're moving parking to King Street? I mean, I, I, I would expect, like, I would expect that these are all things that could potentially be considered uh, on how, to, how to, our, overall, our overall urban environment changes in terms of transportation. Because, yes, the automated vehicle drops you off at your door, and you, you don't really care where it goes. Uh, to park, right? As long as it's back there within an hour, within two hours, whenever your meeting is done, to pick you up again. So yeah, so these are things that I feel like are worth exploring further, which I believe researchers in our lab are also looking into this as well, and how to more efficiently park our automated vehicles. Uh, I have two questions for your simulation. So in uh, in your recent model in front of College Street, you only have cars for in. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so the actual real uh, simulation would be more interrupted because you would have the street cars and cycling, bike lane. So the actual the, impact of the uh, you're right. So I wanted to strictly look at the operations of the passenger cars. Uh, you're right. If if, if uh, I don't need the transit vehicles here, but if we were to introduce uh, street cars, that would we have more stops. We have more stops and road. But I, the trends, I would say, overall would be the same. Yeah, everything, everything was it. No, yeah, for, for, emission, for emissions, it was just the um, the passenger cars I was asking. But yeah, for, for, simulation, for your uh, speed, you, you have just three cars. Yeah, so, yeah oh, oh, in terms of the performance, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, the network is the way it is uh, as you see it outside. It's just, okay. uh, I just changed the behavior of the, of the vehicle. No, I, I know the network, but what about the vehicles on the network? Yeah, so, so we, have, we have transit and passenger cars. We have transit and passenger cars. Yeah. But I only estimated on the plane. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. How did you include that in the same? So you have different vehicle classes and you change the percentage for that. Yeah, so uh, in this 
mechanism, you're allowed to identify a, a, an AB class, or a class of vehicles, um, uh, which followed the AB driving behavior. I created an AB driving behavior. So, so now in this thing you can define AB class, or you... No, in this you, 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 define, you define a you class of vehicles, right? okay. you pick, you, you, pick, you can put a car, you can yeah, put a what, and then you could, um, I didn't do that, but and you could, you could, uh, you could uh, vary the, the proportion of that on the road. Basically, what that was, that was just the purpose. So, here, I'll so I can explain it for you. Uh, so, so, from the uh, the MTO statistics, uh, we had um, the, the in Ontario, 45.6% uh, are passenger cars, while 54.4% are passenger trucks SUVs. So that's the, the proportion of of, um, of passenger cars, passenger trucks uh, on the network or on in Ontario. And um, so, yeah. So basically. I, I, although I made everything 2016 vehicles, I maintain these proportions. So I summed up the proportions. So it has to be just regular passengers. And regular passengers. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to focus mostly on what AVs might influence, which would be our passenger vehicles. You like the gas guzzlers? Fuel cycle emission factor, so the intensity per yeah. kilometer went up. So this is an indicator that there was a congestion buildup on the net, on the network as well. So we, we ended up a lot of the vehicles ended up in the low power modes, yeah. spending and more time on the network. And so for the uh, electric vehicle emission factors of the temperature. Yeah. I think it's possible to uh, devise a uh, operating parameters that are context specific to minimize emissions when it's not going to help you any in terms of your arrival time. But if it's going to improve traffic congestion, then drive more aggressively, like what your current results are showing. So you're, you're alluding to the like to try to come up with a parameter setting that would optimize our mission performance while still not 
negatively impacting your child's performance. So, yeah, no, but this, this is something that could be done. And, uh, but I would, I would say more or less this is in lies with the, the manufacturer who's going to program their, their automated vehicle. So, what we can do as tra tra transportation planners and engineers is to, is to identify, like I've done right now, potential operating, uh, the, the, the space of operating of automated vehicles, and then from there, uh, we can start nitpicking what can we, what can we, what can we change while still being realistic. Um, a lot of the reasons why I went to the extremes was because of the, un the uh, this unknown. Uh, if I were to start mixing the parameters, how realistic would that mix, would that, would that combination be? So this is uh, something worth pursuing. Further, I believe as well, and it's something that should be like the idea of maybe you can sell to a car manufacturer saying, you know, they're trying to sell vehicles to, pe to people who want to ride on time, but also, you know, as a secondary goal, the interest in maybe uh, reducing their great price gas emissions. Another thing to do and they, is, and they, but the, uh, the nice thing about automated vehicles is that they are context uh, aware, I guess. But if, also, if you want to improve your, your, your emission output, just make them. <laughs> so drive like a human, make it automatic, but bring the mess on the road. Yeah. Just bring an electric car. Yeah. Just, just a reason. <laughs> yeah, maybe that answers the answer to my question as well. I don't know whether this is for you or for Ann, but yeah, so you're focusing on greenhouse gases. What has anybody have you looked at the impact on pollution on like hydrocarbon? Is it, is, is it the same no. result or no. would be no. the same? No. Actually, reduce fuel consumption and worsen air pollution. Actually, every time you improve fuel consumption, you can worsen other planet ground because you're burning high pollution. So the answer is electric vehicles. The automated vehicles they might improve our performance, but not the, like the verdict is still out there on, on how how much it will improve. Like, it, it will it will start changing things so so much so that you might end up just going more into a negative direction. So it's our, we have the opportunity, we have attempt to try to pull it back. This is my take on automated vehicles. Chris, <laughs> those green yes. bars there are all very small, but if you blew them up, would they be different from one another? No, no, this, this is, this is uh, the, the electric vehicle, based on how we estimated them, because we couldn't associate them with operating mode, where that's not available yet. Uh, they're Consistent at 13.81 because uh, I'm, I'm still using the average fuel consumption of an electric vehicle, regardless if it's automated. The battery, but there's the no electric yeah, vehicle is not sensitive to yeah. the acceleration or deceleration. Yeah. So it, it's strictly it's it's not operational. It's strictly uh, um, generation of energy, which is consistent. Yeah.